first segment of the 7 o'clock block hour, uh, I just want to take a few minutes and talk about uh, uh, where I think we are with fiscal policy and more particularly what I think the, what, what's driving the administration uh, uh, with respect to fiscal policy. I think, you know, whether you agree with it or not, I think we all need to understand what's going on here uh, with the administration's fiscal policy as we approach this upcoming special session. And in particular, uh, with respect to the payroll tax proposal uh, that they've just put out. For those of you who didn't hear it, or for, and for those of you who did, Michael did an absolutely outstanding segment interview yesterday uh, with Commissioner Sheldon Fisher, uh, Revenue Commissioner Sheldon Fisher, who came on the program for what was going to be one segment and then turned into two. Uh, and I think that interview... Those two segments are probably the best insight uh, into what's driving the administration's fiscal policy of, of any discussion I've, I've, I've ever heard. And I've listened to Governor Walker time and time again. I listened to former Co uh, Revenue Commissioner Randy Hoffbeck uh, time and time again. I've listened to others from the administration talk about uh, fiscal policy. But those two segments with Sheldon Fisher – uh, I think illuminated what's going on with this administration in a fashion that uh, that that was just uh, was 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 even more eye opening I think than than what I than what I'd achieved before. For those of you who didn't hear uh, the interview, uh, you can either go to Michael's SoundCloud page where uh, the entire the entire show from yesterday is podcast. Uh, the interview with uh, Commissioner Fisher is in the sort of in the middle of it. Starts at the seven twenty. Uh, block in the podcast, or I cut it out um, and 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 cut out the, the the podcast of the interview with with Sheldon Fisher and posted it uh, on my blog this morning uh, in connection with a piece I wrote about what I what I came to understand as I as I listened to it uh, yesterday. So you can listen to it uh, as part of that. Uh, you can find that blog post uh, through my Facebook page uh, or through the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets uh, uh, Facebook page. They'll have. They'll have links to the podcast. Um, the, the what I wrote as the title of the blog piece uh, is is frankly uh, uh, what I came away with uh, after listening to to Commissioner Fisher's uh, interview, and I listened to it obviously several times. Uh, but but what I kept using as I listened to it was was sort of my economic ear. What was he saying in economic terms? Uh, is driving the Alaska's fisc Alaska fiscal policy, this administration's fiscal policy. And the title of my blog piece uh, reflects, uh, frankly, what, what uh, the conclusion I came to as I listened to it. The title of the blog piece is the administration's, this administration's let them eat cake fiscal policy. Now, I'm sure most of you know the, the, the origin of the let them keep, eat, eat cake uh, phrase. It was uh, uh, Queen Marie Antoinette. Uh, in the run-up to the French Revolution, uh, when told that the peasants were, uh, were, were, were starving, couldn't even afford bread, uh, in, in a very arrogant, uh, allegedly, in a very arrogant uh, uh, moment, uh, even for her, she said, well, let, let them eat cake then, um, uh, sort, of, sort of not understanding what was going, what was going on uh, among, the, uh, among the, the middle and, and lower class uh, 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 French, and that ultimately led to the revolution because the because the royalty never understood what was going on uh, out in in France. Uh, so the title of my piece is "This Administration's Let Them Eat Cake uh, Fiscal Policy." Here is the core uh, of of what I think is important from Commissioner Fisher's uh, interview yesterday, and here is is what I think people. Uh, need to need to listen to that interview and and need to understand uh, is going on. What Commissioner Fisher really said, uh, when you boil it down, and I've got it uh, in the blog piece, what Commissioner Fisher really said is there's two drivers to to the fiscal policy this administration has come up with. The first driver is fiscal certainty, and and we've heard that for years and years and years now from from this administration. We've heard it from the governor, uh, uh, and and I certainly understand. Certainly understood that before this interview, but 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 Commissioner Fisher sort of drove it home in a, in a couple of different pieces of it. He said we need uh, th that we need fiscal certainty that the businesses, uh, large businesses in Alaska are on the sideline, not investing because we need fiscal certainty. Well, as I thought about that, 
uh, it, it, it dawned on me what they've been saying all along. There is a very strong tie between some large businesses in the state of Alaska and state spending. Uh, and and th- there are some large businesses in this state that are dependent, reliant on, tied to, connected with uh, state spending levels. Uh, in, the construction budget is, is a good example of that. But there are industries, there are large businesses in the state that, are frankly, are dependent on a large education budget. Uh, uh, GCI being one because they're tied to providing wireless to, uh, to, to the bush uh, and, or uh, communications to the bush. Uh, and and the, the anchor tenant for a lot of those communications in the bush uh, is the school district. So they are, there are businesses in this state that are tied to, uh, uh, tied to the state budget. And, and, and they want fiscal certainty. They aren't making investments. The investments are standing on the sidelines until they get fiscal certainty because they want to be sure there's going to be a revenue flow to support the state budget that then will support state spending that, that their businesses are connected with uh, going forward. They want that certainty of, of continued state revenues before they're willing to make the investments necessary uh, to uh, or the, the investments related to those spending levels. Um, so that's 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 a when you listen to Commissioner uh, uh, Fisher's interview, that's a big driver that's going on there. They're responding to large businesses. Why why we're why we're talking about new revenues, why we're talking about sustaining, doing things that sustain state spending levels is we've got businesses out there who are talking to the administration and say, we need fiscal certainty. We need to be sure that you're going to continue to spend at these levels before we make the investments necessary, the, the investments tied to a continuation of those spending levels. So that's one, that's one revelation. The reason we're in this discussion, a large part of the reason we're in this discussion uh, is because, quote, large businesses want the state to, to, to continue to have heavy revenue levels to support spending levels that then support those businesses. It's sort of a wicked circle. Uh, at, at, at one point uh, during the conversation yesterday, as I listened to it again, uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower's warning against the military-industrial complex, uh, his late 1950s, uh, late in his administration's warning that, uh, or late 19, it, it was 1960, uh, his warning that uh, uh, the nation was beginning to be run by the military-industrial complex, that we were having high spending levels, high defense spending levels, because we had built up this industry that was dependent on high spending levels, high defense spending levels. And he was warning that we, we, were, we were on a slippery slope of just generating additional revenues because business needed those additional government revenues because business had been built up and needed those revenues to be able to, uh, uh, to, to justify their continued business model. That's sort of what we've, what we've fallen into in this state. We have businesses that are dependent, large businesses that are dependent on state spending and now want us to have revenue uh, levels, uh, generate new revenue levels in order to continue to support their business models, sort of the Alaska equivalent of the military industrial complex. So that's that's one piece of of, of what you can get out of Commissioner Phil, uh, uh, Fisher's uh, interview uh, yesterday. The second piece uh, is is how they're going about g- developing those new revenues. And there's a key part of the podcast uh, that if you don't listen to anything else, you may want to listen to this. It's around the the four minute thirty second mark of the interview. Uh, as I've got uh, the cutout piece uh, on my blog. And Commissioner uh, Fisher is going through talking about why they selected the payroll tax. Um, and, and he says the, that, they didn't, that, that they couldn't do a sales tax because uh, a, a, a number of the cities, municipalities that have sales taxes push back against it. Some legislators push back against it. So they'd chosen a payroll tax instead of an income tax because they didn't want to tax capital. Now, that's for those who understand economics. Ca- what that phrase means is they didn't want to tax interest, uh, dividends, uh, other things that are earnings generated off capital, um, and 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 frankly, that's revealing because the the income class that gets most of its money uh, off of uh, off of capital gets most of its money from interest and dividends is the top twenty percent. 
So what Commissioner uh, Fisher was was really saying when you delve down into it and listen to it with an economic ear, what he was really saying is we don't want to tax the top 20 percent. We want to generate new revenues to support this military industrial complex that we've built up here in Alaska, large businesses dependent on state spending. But the top 20 percent doesn't want to pay for it. And if you follow through what the administration has done, they have pushed uh, the responsibility for paying for these additional revenues off on middle and lower income Alaskans through the PFD cut, which barely touches the top 20 percent in terms of a significant impact on their on their revenue stream, uh, on their income stream. Uh, and then now through the payroll tax, which again misses the top 20 percent largely uh, because a large part of the top 20 percent income is generated off capital, is generated off income and dividends. So we've got a situation in which large business, businesses have, have, have pushed the administration to generate these additional revenues in order to provide, quote, fiscal certainty, but they don't want to pay for it. And they've pushed um, uh, uh, the revenue responsibility for paying for the Alaska military industrial complex uh, off on the remaining 80% and avoiding the top 20%. There is one piece that uh, of the interview that I just found um, is astounding, uh, and that is when uh, Commissioner Fisher said, uh, essentially, and it's in the blog piece, uh, Commissioner Fisher said, essentially, that they don't think that the fiscal, that the, that the, that the revenue generating measures that they have come to really are that bad. I mean, th he said they, th they, they thought they took into account uh, that um, uh, that that they were trying to minimize the effect on uh, Alaska uh, families. Here here is what he said: uh, the that they had quote tried to structure something that is modest. The administration has tried to structure something in terms of its revenue generating that is modest and bearable, regardless of where the individual earnings fall. Well, that's true of the top twenty percent because they've missed the top twenty percent. They've done a PFD cut that barely touches the top 20 percent, and now they've done a payroll tax that barely touches the top 20 percent. But if you're and, – and so their goal of modest and bearable regardless of where individual earnings fall, that certainly is something that has done the top that, – that, that appeals to the top 20 percent. But if you're in the bottom 20 percent and you're paying 25 percent of your income now in terms of – or you're losing 25 percent of your income in terms of PFD cuts and payroll taxes – that's certainly significant to you. Anyway, that's the that's the takeaway I think that 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 people ought to focus on from the interview that Michael did yesterday with Commissioner Fisher. We're going to talk about it more uh, in the in the upcoming uh, segments. We've got Lynn Gaddis who's joining us in the next segment, uh, and then Andy Holloman will join us at the end of the hour. Well, this is Brad Keithley, uh, but I'm on the other side of the mic today, sitting in uh, for uh, Michael as uh, as a guest host. Uh, while Michael and Terry are off uh, tending to a new grandchild, a wonderful thing for those of you who follow Michael on uh, Facebook. Uh, there's some pictures on, on there of, of, of him and the new grandchild, and you can just you can see the love radiating uh, from the guy's face. So it's, it's wonderful that they're able to spend time with him. Uh, I'm on today sitting in. Chris Story will be here tomorrow and Thursday sitting in. Michael is going to be doing Firearms Friday. He insists, he insists on doing Firearms Friday. Uh, and then Chris will be back for one more day uh, uh, next Monday, and then Michael will be back in the chair after that. On the line with us, we have uh, former representative and now uh, candidate for lieutenant governor, uh, Lynn Gaddis. Uh, good morning, Lynn. How are you? Good morning, Brad. I am just fine. That's that's great. All right. So this is the usual fiscal block uh, on sure. uh, on the Duke show on Tuesday. We're gonna we're gonna spend a few minutes. On your on your run for lieutenant governor, but then we're going to spend the bulk of the time over on uh, on fiscal issues, if you don't mind. G give us give us the, the 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 two minute overview, if you will, of why you're running for lieutenant governor and what what your what your vision is of uh, if elected of of how you serve in that role. So back up for so why I'm running for lieutenant governor, you know. Uh, I looked at how can I help Alaska move forward? I've been able to be in the legislature, if you will, pull back the curtain, and I know how things operate down there. That being said, oh, not all of it's real pretty. 
But um, I thought uh, I've spent some time with a group uh, kind of peering down what's mission critical for Alaska, kind of the uh, 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 where we should go as Alaskans, you know, what we should be doing budgetary-wise. And um, the, one of the places I thought I, I could be of service was lieutenant governor. You know, as we talked last time, I won't go through all 11 of those duties, but 11 uh, duties that the lieutenant governor has. Hey, Lynn, 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 would, would you bring the cell phone a little bit or, or whatever phone you're using a little bit closer to your mouth? It's sort of it's sort of yes. muted. It, am I better now? You are much better now. Thank you. Do you know what? And for all out there, um, I've used BlackBerry for years and I just transferred to an iPhone. So, yes, I'm I, I, I'm old. But so I'm learning how to hold the phone to my uh, mouth. So thanks for, for for you're not the only one that says that. So what I said was. Um, you know, there's 11 things that we discussed last time that a lieutenant governor does. Um, as I dig down into them, reviewing, uh, there's an item number six that I discussed last time, review and file regulations as prescribed by laws. I think that we haven't paid enough attention to the bureaucrats that actually come up with the regulations to the laws that actually have been passed. And, you know, I can go into that a little bit deeper at some other time. Um, certainly my expertise has been budgetary things, and that is huge for this state. And I, I wonder sometimes, do people get tired of hearing us say the same old thing again and again? Does it take three or four times for it to sink in? Do people recognize that we're taxing uh, folks rather than looking for the efficiencies like any business would do and say, okay, guys, we got to we gotta pare things down. So, you know, there's a lot of things that I think a lieutenant governor can do. I think the citizen ballot initiative is going to be big. And, um, you know, I was looking at how many times we as citizens have passed uh, an initiative that said move the darn capital to the road system five times, but it's never happened. So there are many things that a lieutenant governor can be very, very instrumental in doing. And uh, that's why I'm running you know, I certainly have people say, well, shoot, you know, if you're willing to do that, why don't you take a jump up and uh, run for governor? So at this time, certainly I'm paying attention with who's running for governor. Um, I look at it. I, I'm not looking for a stepping stone, really. It's, it's time. I mean, we couldn't be at a scenario that needs leadership, needs people not looking for a political career. Do the job. Go in, go out, be done. You know, so that's really why I'm running for lieutenant governor. Well, personally, I wish you were running for governor, but that's probably a conversation for another time. Let, let's, let's talk. Yes, it is. Let, let, let's talk about fiscal policy. Um, you, uh, I, you have been a longstanding opponent of the of the PFD cut. Uh, for for listeners that don't recall, Lynn, uh, Tammy uh, Wilson, and a couple of others uh, were were the people who stood at uh, stood their ground when the Senate had passed a permanent PFD cut last legislature uh, and in, in, in 2006 uh, had passed a permanent PFD cut uh, and and that had come over that permanent PFD cut had passed the Senate um, and had come over to the House. It went to House finance um, and there were uh, uh, key votes. In House Finance, six key votes in House Finance uh, to stop uh, the PFD cut from becoming permanent. If those six people hadn't stood stood their ground, um, it 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 would have passed through House Finance. And while people said that they thought it would be defeated on the House floor, if you did a head count, you found that probably it would have passed had it made it to the House floor. So these people, in my opinion, are 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 the ones who who have prevented. Uh, protected the state and 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 the bulk of its citizens and and the overall economy from suffering a permanent uh, PFD cut. Lynn was one of those. Tammy Wilson, and as I said, there were there were four others. So, you you've you've had a long standing uh, position with res with respect to PFD and and fiscal policy. Uh, as you said, you'd worked on uh, on the uh, mission critical effort to identify additional budget cuts that could be made. What's your perspective? on the administration's proposal now for a payroll tax on top of PFD cuts uh, and your perspective on on where we are headed uh, in this upcoming special session on on fiscal issues. 
So I like how you said on top of. So we remind the listeners that we have a proposed tax already on top of a tax that we've already taken. When you look at the budget and you look at areas that we haven't addressed, I really look forward to hearing uh, Andy Holloman in the next segment because he and I also differ. But we look at those formula programs that we haven't even opened up. So when we look at the operating budget and we look at it growing and growing, and sometimes I say it's like grandma's sourdough uh, uh, yeast uh, uh Bread, I mean, it just keeps growing and growing. We have to look at those formula programs and pare them down. There are things that there are efficiencies that we haven't even addressed. Um, I had a bill to look at insurance and pooling the state insurance. You know, we have many different uh, um, unions that have different insurances. Put them all together, you guys. We're paying for it. We as Alaskans are paying for it. So now instead of finding those uh, efficiencies, uh, we've got 18 different IT programs, 18 different uh, uh, agencies that have a different, you know, some head of their IT all the way down now. I I, kind of chuckled because it's one of the things we really hammered on with Mission Critical, and I saw no, halfway through last year that the governor looked and hired somebody to really look at that. Well, you know, uh, I even looked at it during uh, my tenure on the uh, Met Sioux School Board, and I said, gee whiz, you guys, you want to put a tablet in every kid's hand, and that's great. But I go down to the local store, and I buy a $200 tablet to do what I need it to do. Why are we buying these $2,000? You know what? Now that times are tougher, they're buying the $200 tablet, the one that gets online, that allows the research, allows a little bit of word processing, you know, and a couple things like that. So, you know, we have been a state where money was never an object. And, man, it is tough for people to get a hold of. Uh, we got to cut back. And, And I think the regular citizens, my customers for my business, they get it. They get that they've either lost jobs. They get that they they haven't gotten a pay raise. Um, these are things that the regular citizens are starting to pay attention to. I got to admit, when we had lots of money, I mean, I was raising kids, doing my thing, and I don't know that I paid the same attention. So I don't fault our citizens for not. But I think that they are now, and they recognize, hold it, hold it. You're going to tax me? You're going to tax me before you've even found these basic efficiencies, and just in the insurance pooling and the audits that have been uh, since my bill, I mean, people re- went really against this because we do have some small insurance companies that, uh, uh, you know, make their money, and it kind of circles back to what you originally said, that we have companies that have built their um, uh, model, business model, on the back of uh, a state of Alaska, and the business model doesn't work without the state funding it, and uh, that's you know that's a poor business model. So, um, you know, I I listened to Sheldon yesterday as well, but we could save about three hundred million. The audit state in these insurance three hundred million. Hmm. I wonder if there's a tax out there looking <laughs> for about that. <laughs> well, it's it's uh, you and I have discussed. You and Michael have discussed it on the show. You and I have discussed it on the show. Sure. Uh, but but it 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 uh, has amazed me as I've looked at Alaska fiscal issues over the last several years. When we had money, there were lobbyists down in 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 Juneau that were that were entirely focused on whose compensation depended on getting you know pro- getting grants. To various projects, they would they would lobby for this project or that project. And when we had money, it was fairly easy to do. We should have been saving it. If you look at the long term sustainable fiscal plan that Scott Goldsmith has, has advocated for a long time in the state, we should have been saving money in anticipation of the day like today, like today when when oil is no longer sufficient to, to to provide us an operating revenue. We should have been saving that money for those days. But there were people down there lobbying. Uh, to 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 get that money granted to a new program or to a capital budget or to build you know two new engineering buildings one in UAF and one at UAA <laughs> to build a new athletic arena to do you know to do this that and the other thing people were down there you know lobbyists were down there being paid what has amazed me is that those same lobbyists are still there they're still doing the same thing but the argument now is don't cut my program 
uh, don't cut my, you know, my budget, uh, uh, you know, cut somebody else or, hey, let's go get new revenue um, uh, and let's let's take it off uh, off somebody else's back and keep my program going and keep keep my uh, my situation going. It I don't know that people really understand the 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 level of lobbying that's going on in Juneau uh, among the special interests to to keep government spending at 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 at, at high levels. Yeah, I, I'm not sure either. Um, I don't truly blame lobbyists. We need to have a system. And so the private industry, my private business, I, I can make those efficiencies. I plan in the reserves, whether it's engine reserves for airplanes or whatever. I, government doesn't do that. So when we talk about they should be saving, well, of course they should. But you actually have to put, and we've talked about this, a spending cap into law based on your revenues. And so, um, you know, that's what a business does. But you have to put it into law. You really do. Um, uh, politicians are going to spend money, and they're going to spend money that their constituents want them to spend. So we have to have some other mechanism that puts the people of Alaska in the picture as well. And I've always advocated that the people, I mean, that's why our ballot initiatives and our referendums, I think, are so important, because the people, we the people, should have that opportunity to to weigh in. So, you know, uh, we're not going to, I really don't feel that we're going to make the necessary efficiencies unless the people of Alaska come out and say, okay, okay, we've seen it, we've heard you over and over you can't get 21 votes on that side. You can't get 11 votes on that side. And darn it, if you do, there's that one guy called the governor that won't go along with it. So here's what you got to do is the people of Alaska need to come out. And they intrinsically know that, not the businesses that depend on state dollars to keep them in business. But people know that. A, they got to get out and vote. B, I know they're sick and tired of hearing about the budget. I mean, I came back from in 2016. I know you said 20, 2006. I knew you meant 2016 for those listening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I wasn't you. in there that long. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, but in 2016, I had people in the grocery store, good friends of mine, say, why didn't you do your job? And I said, what was my job? What did you think my job was? Well, your job was to spend money. and to, You know, they did not realize that our job – you know, it is is only our only job that legislators have is to pass a budget. That's it. You know, and um, I said, but do you not think it was correct not to take your PFD until until we have made those necessary efficiencies until the people have weighed in on the people's money? And she said, well, but I, I didn't know that was your job. So, you know, I will tell you that these uh, independent expenditure groups back back home, they made a dent in a lot of people and their perception, what people were doing. So I appreciate the, uh, you know, the shout out for us standing firm. And I know that we had some of our colleagues that were just ticked that we, we said, no, a bad bill should go nowhere. And this is a bad bill. We all know it. And if you know it, then let's stop it. And, and I'll say this, Medicaid expansion was a bad bill. We stopped it in finance that year, and uh, now we're looking at how to roll things back, certainly from a national re uh, level, and the state is losing money left and right here. And so we, it's a bad bill. If it's bad, you shouldn't pass it. Lynn, I want to continue the discussion. I, I'm not sure Andy got the memo about, about the next segment, uh, and he hasn't called in yet. So would you mind holding over to the next segment? And, oh, not and, at all. And I want to not continue this conversation with you about uh, on, a, on a slightly uh, different point. Um, sure. So I'm gonna, we're going to take the break now. This is Brad Keithley uh, sitting in for Michael Dukes today. Uh, we're going to take our station break, and when we come back, uh, we'll pick up again with Lynn Gaddis. Well, this is Brad Keithley sitting in for Michael today, uh, doing our uh, fiscal. Uh, I'm doing the fiscal segment from the other side of the microphone while, while Michael and Terry are off uh, attending to a brand new grandchild. Congratulations to them and to their daughter and son-in-law uh, on uh, on bringing another. I guess it's not a Duke's. I'm not sure. I know what the last name is, but a Duke's line. Uh, uh, life into the world, and and we're just so uh, happy for uh, Michael and Terry and their family, and uh, in in having uh, the the new addition uh, on the line with us, we've got uh, Lynn Gaddis. Andy Holloman was going to join us 
uh, I, in my vision, Andy Holloman was going to join us for this segment. I thought I'd lined it out with him last week, but uh, Andy goes off fishing uh, uh, from time to time, and, and I suspect maybe the uh, the waters of Prince William Sound were more inviting than uh, than putting up with me uh, on the radio. So uh, we'll, we won't have Andy today, but Lynn was kind enough to agree to uh, continue over. Welcome back, Lynn. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks for joining us. Oh, you're very, very welcome, and I'll thank Andy for not showing up, giving me a little bit more time. <laughs> All right, I want to uh, I want to to uh, uh, delve a little bit more into uh, it, it, exactly how the governor is proposing to to add you know these new revenues that that they need. Um, we've talked a little bit about the need for new revenues uh, and the fact there are additional cuts and. And I've talked in the past on this program and elsewhere about the Hammond 5050 plan, which I think would uh, would avoid the need for uh, uh, for new revenues, uh, assuming we do make some additional cuts. So, but we've talked about those. Let's talk about the approach, the the separately the approach the gov- the administration's taking, and in fact, parts of the legislature have taken to 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 develop these new revenues. One is, I mean, the first is the PFD cut, and and. And you stopped, you and Tammy and others stopped uh, the adoption of PFD cuts on a permanent basis, but they've done it now on an annual basis. The governor did it with a veto uh, last year, uh, and now this year the legislature did it by passing an operating budget that short paid uh, uh, the PFDs. Notwithstanding the fact the statute says that the administration shall, that the, that the uh, 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 permanent fund corporation shall transfer Fifty uh, percent of the earnings to the dividend fund, and the government shall pay out that fifty percent. The legislature short-circuited it by passing an operating budget that cut that fifty percent in in half. Uh, so the legislature did it this year. They've done it. They're they're doing it on an annual basis. Tim Bradner wrote an article uh, in the in the ADN last week or the week before last that said uh, that's now the reality that they're just gonna, that, that that they're going to do it as long as this leadership team's in place. They're just going to continue doing it on an on an annual basis. So that's one piece of how they're filling up uh, these uh, these these additional revenues, these new revenues they need. Uh, and then now the governor's come in and stacked uh, a proposed payroll tax uh, on top of that. As I as I talked about in the first segment of the show, it it's it 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 dawned on me. It it is increasingly dawning on me that the things they're doing, they're sort of going out of their way to twist these new revenue proposals to avoid the top 20 percent. The, the PFD tax, the PFD tax uh, uh, hits the, the middle and lower income segments uh, much harder than it does the top 20 percent. It barely, barely hits the, the income levels of the top 20 percent. Uh, and, and the payroll tax is designed in a way uh, to avoid hitting, largely hitting the same, the same top 20 percent as, as ITEF, the Institute of Taxation and Econ- Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy said in an analysis they did for the legislature earlier this session, the big bulk of a payroll tax hits the hits outside the top 20 percent. It hits the upper middle income and the middle income families that don't get a lot of a lot of their revenue from uh, interest and dividends and things like that from quote capital, uh, uh, but get it from wages. It hits them much harder than it hits the top 20 percent and indeed the top five percent and indeed the top one percent that get the bulk of their income, a large portion of their income, and then down to the one percent, the bulk of their income from 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 those capital items, interest and, and, and dividends that are not hit by the payroll tax. So so there's there's a design going on. They're, they're going out of their way to find these techniques, uh, these tax te- tax techniques through the PFD cut and through the payroll tax that's avoiding putting any response, any significant responsibility for these new revenues they want to raise on the top 20 percent, and they're hitting middle income and lower income Alaskans uh, much, much harder. Anyway, that's my rant, but I'd like your perspective on on the techniques they're using to, to, to raise this additional revenue, this new revenue that they, that, that they think they want, and, and your perspective on their proposals. So, Brad, great rant, by the way, and I thought, boy, there's so many places that I could go. Um, Certainly, um, I I, I hate that word, revenue measure. Uh, It's a tax. 
Anytime we're going to take money out of people's pockets, it's a tax. So I like to call you taking half of the PFB and saying it's a revenue measure. It's really just for taking money out of your pocket. Secondly, the fact that taking half of the PFB, whether it was the governor or whether it was the legislature this year, uh, that took they haven't used it to fund government. And I think that's the part that I think many folks don't get. That we, it's not like they had to have the money to fund government. They haven't used it. And I think more importantly, um, we haven't, you know, whether you look at our revenue forecasts and how the uh, administration looks at the forecast, and, and they're, I think they're going to have a fall forecast out, and we'll see how they go through that. We're back to that spend cap based on real revenues. And so, you know, I, I have a thought process in regards there, and I won't spend a lot of time. We talked about it earlier. But I think the bigger thing is to talk about how we're taxing certain folks and not others. And, I, and, and you heard the same thing that I heard, but, of course, we've been doing that. That is what this administration has been trying to do. Um, it's some could say the donor class, for those listening, there's a lot of folks that work every day, they go and vote when it's necessary, they pay their uh, uh, um, time, but they're not part of that big lobbyist group. They have not hinged their business on state spending. And it's interesting, those that come out and say, you've got to pass this because we've got to have money, because we've got money invested in the state of Alaska, and we need this. We need the state to basically keep funding us. And, uh, you know... uh, We're at a precipice right now. The state is at a huge culture clash where we as a state have funded many businesses and we can't afford to do that now. So how do we do it? Does the state continue doing it? Well, if you do and take the money out of people's pockets, that's how we'll continue that. Or do we start diversifying and saying, you know what, it's not the state's job to fund private businesses. It's the state's job to truly pave the way and get out of the way. So um, I I went to a meeting last night where there was a lot of legislators there, and they basically anticipate that this uh, PFD tax probably back up the uh, um, payroll tax. Yeah, the payroll tax. They probably don't. They don't think it'll see the light of day. They think that uh, uh, this SB 91 fix um, will probably suck up all the air in the room, and they're pretty well. You know, uh, Bishop is saying, you know, why did the governor put two very different things, very large things on the same call? Um, A lot of folks will be spending this SB 91, a huge uh, uh, omnibus bill that will need to be re-looked at, look at things that are or are not working, and uh, uh, acknowledge the public's uh, viewpoint on what's happening out here with crime. What uh, you know? Are we not taking care of its citizens? So they don't think that this, this payroll tax will see the light of day. I, there was one thing, I, and, and let me say, I I respect Sheldon Fisher. I like Sheldon Fisher. Um, I I have thought highly of him as as commissioner of administration. Uh, I thought highly of him before when he was at ACS. I thought highly of him when he ran uh, when he ran against Don Young in the in the Republican primary at one point. Uh, I, I have respected his views, listened to his views, but I've got to admit, I broke out laughing at one point uh, <laughs> yes, yesterday in, in, the, in the interview, and, and, and this is the point that I broke out, and, and I've got this in the blog piece for people that want to that see it and then listen to the interview at that point and, and focus on it themselves, that, that the administration had, quote, and this is a quote, tried to structure something. He's talking about the payroll tax and the, and the PFD cuts, the combined the two steps, quote, tried to structure something that is modest and bearable regardless of where the individual earnings fall. This was in response to a comment that Michael had made that said, hey, you're hitting the, the middle and the, and the lower income classes a hell of a lot harder than you're hitting, you know, the top 20 percent or the top 5 percent or the top 1 percent. And, and, and the response was, quote, We've tried to structure something that is modest and bearable, regardless of where the individual earnings fall. That's just wrong. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's not. It's not even arguable. It's just wrong. If you look at the the impact of what the governor's proposed, the administration's proposals on an average family of four, 
the the combination of the payroll tax and the PFD cut, and 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 I take the PFD in in this analysis, I use the PFD cut that the that the legislature came to and the governor signed last session, which is an eleven hundred dollar uh, PFD cut, cutting the PFD from fifty percent of earnings down to twenty five percent of earnings. When you look at that by income class, it takes twenty five percent of the income of the lowest 20% uh, of the lowest income tax, uh, the lowest bracket, income bracket of Alaskans, 25%. When you look at what it does to the upper um, uh, 20%, it takes less than 3% of their income. When you when you move up from the lowest 20%, it's 25% of the, of the lowest, it's 12% of the next, 8% of the next, and, and something like 7% uh, of the next. Even the the upper middle income bracket, the the those between the the sixty percent and the eighty percent mark uh, uh, of Alaska's uh, population broken down by income, even in the upper middle income bracket, they're paying double under the administration's proposal, double than than what the twenty than, than what the lowest twenty percent is. So it is laughable, laughable for the administration to claim that they tried to structure something that is modest and bearable regardless of where the individual earnings fall. They didn't even try. These mechanisms that they have adopted, the PFD cut and the payroll tax, the slick payroll tax, are designed entirely to avoid putting the burden, any burden, any significant burden, on the top 20 percent of of income and to slide all of the cost of this increased government spending that they want to maintain down on upper middle, middle, lower middle, and 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 low income Alaskans. Anyway, that's my perspective. Do you, do you have a reaction to that? <laughs> well, and and I would say that um, you know I know Sheldon Fisher or Commissioner Fisher well. Um, I had the administration budget, so I worked with him closely. And the bottom line is he's a smart guy, and so he should deserve our respect. But he has a boss that has a particular uh, mission, and he works for the boss. So, you know, it's not that the guy isn't smart, but uh, his boss has given him particular marching orders, and his boss is running for reelection. And, you know, so those are the things that we see in this uh, state when we see folks running for re-election, they do things that I don't think are necessarily good for this state, but how does he get re-elected? Who's the donor class? Who are the large groups of people that will come and help him? And so that's the that's a struggle, and he's, uh, he's, he's working with them. But I'm hoping that the uh, um, Senate uh, stays strong and does what they say that they're going to do and say, we're not going to do that. That's ridiculous. Well, well Lynn, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you for joining me for these two segments. This is Brad. Oh, you're Keith- very welcome. This is Brad Keithley sitting in for Michael Dukes. Uh, we will be coming back in.